Anyway, I'm Mike, KD5KXF, and Eric and I decided to do something a little different earlier this year. Actually, it was last year. I got really interested in a project called the Minima, and it's a far-hand project, and it's basically an all-HF mode rig, okay? Uh, it was really designed to be built Manhattan style or ugly style. Some guy came out with an eagle file for it, and I know Eric uh, messes with making circuit boards, and I was like, hey, man, I'd like to make a circuit board for this rig. So we built a few. Uh, we, we had a few prototypes made, and Eric approached me about doing a presentation with him about just that very thing, and it's kind of like, wow, we got time to do a project? Uh, Eric assured me, yeah, man, we got time to do a project, so, so we did it. Uh, it's that mouse button, or I, you know what? You might be able to just hit the space bar. There you go. Well, all of this stuff starts with an, I've got my keys propped under there trying to, I didn't have a two by four handy. Drove the wife's car, didn't bring the truck, otherwise we'd have been fine. Um, it all starts with an idea, guys. The whole concept of our presentation is from thought to working product, okay? You know, these ideas, when we have them, they never happen in an ideal spot. Typically with me, they happen when I'm driving. Um, some of my best ideas have happened driving back from uh, Branson, Missouri for the 4SQRP ham convention, where I've seen some things, I've heard some presentations, I get some ideas. So most of the things I design, man, they're on paper napkins. I mean, that's how they start, okay? So we have to improvise when we get these ideas, but we have to capture them right then because you guys know how an idea is, right? Pretty soon I get hungry and that idea is gone and I'm thinking hamburger, hit it. Or it might be someone else's idea. Wow, we're missing part of the... Hang on a minute here. Oh my. <laughs> This is not how you want to start your presentation, but, uh, but all right, let's go to the next slide. Let's go to that one too. All right. You know, a lot of ideas that we work with are other people's ideas. <clears throat> when we first start building, we're generally building other people's circuits. And those circuits may come from online publishing. Somebody's put it up on your particular interest group's email reflector. Or it might be in a periodical or a publication. Could be in an AWRL handbook. Hit the next one. <clears throat> but no matter where you got it, I highly recommend asking if they've made any changes to that circuit. Because I have built a lot of things and then it's just dead. And then you spend a lot of time troubleshooting only to find out later on that there was you know, some errata published on this thing that Oh yeah, by the way, uh, that transistor wasn't shown right. Or it might be like a huge resistance value uh, choking off RF. I've had that happen before. But you know, no matter where you find that idea, it's really a good idea to try to reach out to the author or publisher, whether via email or find out if they've got a Yahoo group. Just, I, I know a few of you guys in here, who's built something before? Sweet. So who's built something from scratch? Not a kid. Who's designed something and built it? Nice. All right, let's go to the next one. Now, this is the big thing for me, parts. You know, I start with my junk box, but I never have everything I need. And a lot of the things I build, I build QRP radios. Um, and a lot of times I'm looking at things that were designed back in, uh, you know, like SSDR days when that publication was current. You know, when that publication came out, probably 25% of those resistors, or pardon me, uh, transistors were obsolete. So, you know, we deal with a lot of obsolete parts in ham radio, at least in the QRP side. So you do your searching and you start making your parts list. You know, you're going to go through people like Mauser, but there's some other places to go too. Fortunately, here locally, we're blessed. We have an electronics parts store called Tanner's, where a lot of times I can get things that maybe I can't find anywhere else. 
some, some of those older guys, the most of what we have is obsolete. Well, <clears throat> and that's why an awful lot of this stuff gets designed with obsolete parts. You know, some of those hot HP uh, signal diodes? I mean, yeah, I mean, you, you can't find those from anywhere else except an old guy. He's, yeah, he's got a few. You know, one of the really important things, though, if you've got a local club, put the word out what you're doing. You'd be amazed at how many people have a huge junk box and can tell you immediately, oh, yeah, I've got some of those, and can even find it. Okay, let's do the next one. Now, working with RF transistors, sooner or later, you're going to hit the wall. It's going to call for something, and it's going to be BS. Part substitution books are helpful, but they're only so helpful because, let's face it, man, when's the last time Motorola printed one of those? Uh, you know, I've got one on my shelf. Sometimes you'll get lucky through uh, some of these people that make replacement transistors, but you're going to spend, you know, five bucks for this one part, and you're going to be upset about it too. Sometimes it makes more sense to change the design. And consider other technology and substitutions. I put this up here for a reason. Uh, you know, not a lot of hams are messing around with graphene-based RF transistors. Uh, there are some guys on the microwave side that are doing this. But let's talk simpler. Let's talk about, uh, you know, FETs and JFETs that you can get a hold of, J310s. You know, you can take the final RF section you run a couple of those bad boys in parallel, and I can get five watts out, whereas before, man, that 3866 or whatever they called for, maybe I'm getting two and a half. So when I say consider other technologies and substitutions, you might want to look at redesigning some of the parts of what you're working on. Go ahead and give it the click. So we've gathered all these parts. Now what? You know, we're prototyping something. Go ahead and give it a click, Steve. Well, let's talk about prototyping and breadboarding. This works great for audio amplifiers. Works okay for logic circuits, um, but pretty much everything else that we're gonna do in radio with the exception of keyers, maybe some control logic, pretty much everything else, we're gonna have to breadboard in a way that deals with RF better. And I, when I first got into ham radio, I tried breadboarding with one of these using RF. You know what I figured out pretty quick? You get very, very uncalculatable results. And, you know, with the simplest of things, you know, I was uh, breadboarding a simple one transistor RF amp using a 2N2222. We were going to have a 2N2222 bake off, and I'm like tweaking around with this thing, and, and I'm seeing these really interesting spurs off of the frequency. Well, Guess what? You don't have an RF ground plane, you're going to get that. Let's go to the next one. What you got going on there? Solderless breadboards. You know, like I said, these are okay for some things. You're needing to figure out capacitor and resistor values by ear for a particular tone you're trying to capture. Cool. But, you know, they're not so good when we're testing filters, oscillators, mixers, VFOs. Let's go to the next one. Now, here is where I think prototyping really comes in. And that's building it ugly style. You've got your big copper ground plane. So there's no excuse for it to not work. And you can build fairly quickly. Now, this guy on the right, that's an awful lot of wire. I don't like that much point-to-point -point wiring. So most of my ugly style, I try to design around that. I tend to lean more towards the left-hand side. Yes, sir? Well, I'm so glad. I'm going to have one person that has it. I thought, oh, crap, man, these guys all know this stuff. Well, we're going to get to that. Manhattan is called that because it kind of looks like you're looking down in a city. And, you know, even my, when my boy was four years old, he used to look at what I was building. He said, it looks like a little town. Yeah. That's why we call it Manhattan. Now, ugly, ugly is a beautiful thing. Okay, let's, let's go on to the next one. 
and it doesn't have to be that ugly. Uh, this is one of the nicer, ugly things I've ever seen built. And this guy took an X-Acto knife and he cut isolation pads in his board. Now we're getting closer to Manhattan or even PC board style design. But, you know, this guy thought out of the box and said, hey man, how can I just whip this out? And he knocked that thing out in 30 minutes and bam. Okay, let's go on the next one. Now, earlier ugly guys, they used to use like 1.8 mega ohm resistors and they built standoffs on their boards and would kind of build up above the board off of these standoffs. You see, most of this stuff is in the air. Your ground is still right here. So anything that's got to go to ground gets attached to that board. Everything else doesn't. Gets attached to the other things. Yeah, pretty ugly. Okay, we can go to the next one. Now, when you're building ugly style, a few hints. I built ugly for a long time. Glue your ICs upside down to the board and you can have your leads bent out, floating in the air. And then your grounds, you just push them down and you solder them to your board. Matter of fact, if you have enough grounds, uh, and a lot of ICs will have enough grounds, you won't even have to glue it. Man. You just, you got that sucker stuck down because you've grounded it there. Of course, like I said, you can use 1.8 mega ohm resistors to stand off, support non-grounded parts for the circuit. You can use terminal strips, glued or soldered to the board to hold these items up. You know, the key though to ugly style is be creative, work quick. Sometimes, um, I try to stay pretty close. What's that? Uh, he was saying that you stay pretty close to the way the circuit diagram is drawn. And when we get into bigger circuits, this is really important guys, you want to break up these blocks and you want to keep these blocks in mind as you're building because running a jumper all the way across, you know, an oscillator and an amp that's carrying audio can have really unexpected results. You, you might not like the results you get. Manhattan style construction. This is pad style construction. Basically, we're taking pads. They have pre-made pads or you can punch them out uh, using a punch and we're gluing them to our ground plane board and we're tinning the tops of them. All right, you can bang it on to the next one. Now, for a long time, Harbor Freight made this punch. The same people that make that punch, now Harbor Freight doesn't carry it, you can get it through Bear, or is it Grizzly? I think it's Grizzly. I may have put Bear, but it's, uh, it's actually Grizzly. And they're a tool importer, they carry the same imported crap that Harbor Freight does. But essentially, you take this punch, you can knock out all these little pads, you throw them in your Altoids box, you're set to go. What are you punching? Is it a copper sheet? Or mm -hmm. That's a copper sheet. Copper sheet. Oh, I use double-sided. You use double-sided? Mm-hmm, I do. And I prefer the old kind that had the, uh, the compressed paper substrate. You know, when you get into this PC glass board, you pretty much have to mount that thing in a vise and yeah it's, it's it's like physical attention deficit disorder it's hard exactly I'm building my own little circuit board okay. custom made one off so With, uh, those right there are three sixteenths, uh, and that's about the size I use. All right, let's bring it to the next one. Now, there's a company, uh, QRP Me, a guy Rex W1REX. He's in Maine. He makes these things called knee pads, and they're square. And you see, he has these little ones already made up for ICs. You can build beautiful stuff with his stuff, and not too expensive either. And they just snap apart. They come on a sheet and snap them apart. All right, we're going to the next one. Now, when starting construction, it's helpful to figure out the dimensions of your parts because now all of a sudden we're going to take a piece of paper and we're going to take a circuit board and, you know, so what size piece of copper do I start on? You know, I got pieces of copper like this. You know, obviously I don't want to build that and then trim it down with snips later on. It's 
going to be ungainly. It's going to be hard to deal with. A lot of times when I'm building modular things, and when I say modular, let's think about a DC receiver. DC receiver has several blocks in it, okay? I may build one block each on a very small piece of copper board. You can glue it down on a piece of wood or a piece of uh, masonite, join all the things together so they share the ground plane by soldering the ground planes together. But I try to build modularly and I use scratch paper. I sit down, I get my components out, I try to get an idea of how much bigger does my circuit have to be than the way I've drawn it. Some people actually draw about actual size for Manhattan after having done it for so long. There's guys that can do it. When you're ready to start, you glue down your pad with super glue. You take your, your needle nose pliers, you hold it down for 10 seconds, take your soldering iron and tin it, and that heat is going to take care of the remaining you know, liquidity in your super glue, bonds it down, good to go. All right, let's go to the next one. I have never had anything burn my nose as bad as these fumes you're going to get with a soldering iron. I have a little fan that I keep on my desk, just blowing across to keep me from doing that. All right, we'll go on to the next one. Gridded paper is going to help with the design. This guy is doing some different pads. He's basically taking a paper cutter, he's made these strips, and he's using uh, snips to cut the rectangles that he wants. He's designing it out on his gridded paper and then transferring it to copper. And we all use the cheap super glue. Uh, I look for it in you know, flea markets where you've got 15 of them on a card for a buck. Put them, in a, put them in a Ziploc bag, store them in your fridge. They'll keep forever. All right, we'll go on to the next one. Now, you see how he's basically designing his circuit here on the board. He's making notes for the different components. And he's building a lot further ahead than I do. Man, I glue down a few pads, I solder parts, and I move along that way. This guy builds entire modules where he's gluing these things down, making notes for his parts, then he builds it almost like he had a, a PC board to work with. Is he soldering lead parts or service mount parts or both on top of them? The, well, these don't have any parts soldered on them yet. He's only right. tinning the top of them. Sure, you can, but uh, honestly, if you're going to use surface mount, yeah. you're almost better off cutting uh, islands. For a long time, there was a QRP club that had what they called an island cutter, and it was just a, it was just a, a bit that cut a ring, and literally would make a ring of separation or isolation. Yeah, there used to be a guy out in California. He and his son had a, a machine shop, and they sold them through an ad in QSP. Yep. Well, I've seen guys that build with surface mount that way. And the guy I saw doing it had set up a really neat little drill press using a Dremel tool and that bit and was, I mean, making really nice stuff with it. And if I was going to work with surface mount, I mean, honestly, I don't think I would work with the pads. I think I would be cutting into the RF board itself, or I mean the ground plane board. All right, go ahead. Now, this guy does some neat work. That's AA7E, I think AA7EE. -E. And right there he is building a, oh, what is it? It's a wheat bridge, wheat bridge regenerative receiver. That's what it was. But I mean, does really neat work. And if you look at it, you ask where Manhattan gets its name from. Yeah. You know, I'm kind of like Batman standing on the corner of the building looking down Gotham City there. So each of those little rectangles there are just a, a copper square with an insulating mm -hmm. There's nothing on there. That's not a little edge board. It's just a little no. square. And he, he's yeah. kind of out of, in, with a square punch as opposed to a circle. Yeah, well, he has them made that way. Uh, Rex W1REX has them made this way, but there's guys that cut them in a uh, use a paper cutter, yeah. and they'll cut squares, rectangles. Uh, I've always stayed with one size. The only thing I do differently is when I'm dealing with ICs, 
But for the most part, I've always just bashed out a whole bunch of 3 16 diameter pads. But you got to admit, that's pretty neat. I, I don't build that neat. I guess you could strip mm -hmm. power lead going down the whole thing. Above oh, the yeah. Um, I've built that way before, um, where I've literally taken a strip, and that, that was my positive rail running down the entire board. And works pretty good. Another thing you can do when you're building this way is taking pretend bus wire where you actually need to have some jumpers and running pretend bus wire and the little coffee stick stirs, uh, you know, the plastic ones, using those for insulators. Um, and that works pretty well too. All right, we'll go on the next slide. Now, here's a pad made for an IC. And the simplest way I've found to do these is actually either putting it in, a, let me turn that off, putting it in a vise. By putting it in a vise, you, you hold it pretty still. You can take a hacksaw and cut these and clean them up with a needle file. I've also cut them with a needle file and a pair of pliers. And I did that for a long time. And I just finally got to the point of, you know, why am I doing this? So I do it a little different now. I kind of go back to my ugly days. And I take that IC, I flip it upside down. I mark with a Sharpie which one is pin one. And I make sure as I'm laying everything out that I'm calculating how it goes on that IC. If you build one LM386 audio amp this way, you'll be fine. But the first time you do it, it's almost like, Wait a minute, which one's been one? Okay, you know, and, and counting, and it's kind of interesting. We'll go on the next one. Now, QRP Me makes some pretty cool ones, and as you'll notice, he makes some that are for SA612, you know, surface mounts. We use a lot of uh, 612s in QRP, and as I understand it, they're not making them anymore. You can still find them some, but now surface mounts are easy ones to find. So he's making boards where you can convert that surface mount into uh, one that's the size of a 612 as far as the hookups go. Pretty smart idea. Mm -hmm. well, well, you know, as a matter of fact, Eric asked me if I was going to talk about perf board construction. When I first got into ham radio, I got into some perf board construction, and maybe I'm just not English enough, but these English over in the GQRP club, man, they build stuff on perf board, no problem. I build stuff on perf board, and it looks like somebody took a torch to it. It's, I love perf board. It's just not my thing. Uh, perf board with no copper on it, plain old perf. Yeah. Right, I've done that all the time. Well, I've done some of that, and... Now my preference has been this uh, Manhattan mixed with a little bit of ugly. And that's not to say it's any better than any other one. Whichever one you're comfortable with, man, the whole idea of prototyping is knocking it out quick. Let's find out what's going to happen with it. So we can get to some measurements. We can actually see, hey, what kind of design do we have? All right, let's hit it. Now, some suggestions for prototyping. Build it in modules. You know, unless the project is very simple, you need to break it down into functional blocks, such as amplifier oscillator. And you need to include any power supply items as its own block too. And you need to test every module, including the power supply. You know, I've, I don't know about you guys, but when I first started designing and, and messing with uh, small voltage regulators, well, you know, I thought I understood the concept, but it's real easy to not get the right load on that thing in the way of a resistor or something like this and end up without the right power. Everything that we build can be screwed up by a beginner. I know. I have done it. Oh, worst kind. <laughs> worst kind. Uh, but, you know, build and, and test as you go. Because the one thing I've learned about this, guys, is somebody's not going to miraculously fix this stuff that's not working. When you finish this, it's still going to be dead as a doornail, most likely, or not work the way you want it to. All right, let's go to the next one. Start small. If you're inexperienced, start with something simple. You know, audio amps, keyers for your rig, uh, 
all kinds of things you could do. Uh, you know, maybe you'd like to have a, a voice recording auto uh, deal for your mic. I'm not a sideband guy, but hey, the technology's out there. You know, if you're not figuring out the circuits that you build, man, this is just soldering practice. There's really no point in doing it. Uh, we can't beat the prices of most accessories. So the only way that building an accessory makes sense is if I can make exactly the accessory I want and I can learn something from it. Build a reference library, a double RL handbooks, and I recommend going back to the 80s for, for one. They're cheap. You'll find them out here at these flea markets, you know, a couple of bucks, and they're going to cover some things differently than your current ARRL handbook does. Um, I highly recommend the EMRFD, uh, that's Experimental Method of RF Design. That's a great book. It's an ARRL publication. Substitution books are handy. Component catalogs. And when I say component catalogs, you know, Mouser makes one about this thick. It's their EE version. But an awful lot of what they have in that catalog are spec sheets for those different parts, and having those specs is going to help a lot. All right, I'm banging on to the next one. Man, the tools that you need for this type construction are really simple. You need a soldering iron and a stand. You don't even need a soldering station. One of the best guys I know, as far as builders goes, he uses a, a weller with a stand he built. Needle nose pliers, flush cutters, wire strippers, snips or something similar if you're cutting pads. A multimeter, a decent light to work under. Really not a lot. That's a pretty short list when you think about it that you're going to build a radio with that. All right, go ahead and bang it out. Now, so after your idea's been prototyped, what now? Well, if it works, congratulations. Now you can spend some time modifying it, changing some things, seeing if you can hot rod it a little bit. With the biggie, put it in a nice case. Even if it's ugly, ugly, ugly construction, you put that sucker in a nice case, Nobody's going to know. You know, the Paloma box looks pretty good compared to my construction, you know. It's high end. Would it make a cool club project? Maybe there's other people in your club that would like to build something like this. Group builds are a lot of fun, and after you've built one, you're, you're the perfect guy to lead them and show them how to build one. Or maybe you want to make it into a kit. Now, the decision about making a kit gets pretty interesting. How many of them are you going to make? Let's go to the next one. And then it leads to this. Should we make a printed circuit board? Now, if you decide to do so, look for people in your club that do this. Even if you want to learn to do it, getting somebody who's done this before, walking you through, setting up the software, walking you through, oh, yeah, I use this. Oh, no, don't use that company, man. This is what happened when I used them. There's a bit to it of running into somebody who's done it before. Prepare the files. Have a test run of boards made before you go out and knock out 100 to 200 of them. Especially if it's a complex board. Uh, if you've got a complex project, you go with that minimum number of boards, five of them. Build them. Uh, three of them. Three of them, okay. That's right, yeah, but with the minimum, yeah, we did three. Um, and build them. Because you want to make sure it works before you go drop the cash to pump out a whole bunch of boards. Trust me, they're not cheap. All right, let's hit it again. Remember, sometimes our RF projects work a lot better when we're building them ugly style in Manhattan. Uh, you can pick up noise. You can pick up all sorts of things when we put it on a PC board. And one of the problems with a PC board, that software makes it really easy to miniaturize. So you want to be careful about how far you squeeze it down. And you want to be mindful of what blocks are next to each other. Just like when you built it on your, on your flat copper board. That saves a lot of trouble. All right, hit it. Well, we'll talk about some. That's a, isn't that a beautiful Manhattan construction job right there? That's a SW30+. Plus. It was built Manhattan style, and a bunch of people built these on QRPL, kind of a kind of an email build-a-thon. It's pretty neat. So, do we have any questions? Either I covered it real well. 
or everybody knew more than I knew to begin with. <laughs> yes, sir. Good point. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, I spent about 14 bucks for my punch. Uh, that's, that's about the upper limits of what I'd pay for something like this. <laughs> yeah, no kidding, man. I really haven't, but you know what? I've never built a 10 meter rig. Um, and I kind of wondered about that too because I built a 20 meter rig and wondered if I was going to run into it there by inadvertently creating a capacitance. Yes, sir. I wondered about that and I did measure some bores that were in the area and I wondered about the So you think the thinner board might be, the thinner board would be the bigger problem then? Interesting. Well, and, and quite honestly, there might be an advantage to using glass boards where they're single-sided. I buy copper in bulk if I find it cheap. I buy it cheap, and it can even be a little ratty looking, and I'll take a SOS pad to it. You know, it's, I try to buy my stuff cheap and in quantity. Uh, that way I don't feel so bad when I make mistakes or screw up and run out of space and have to lift a circuit onto a bigger board, which I've had to do before, and it's kind of a drag. I to them together in the end. <laughs> <laughs> I have, uh, I, you know, I build my modules that way. Yes, sir. I don't know. That's what they're doing today. No, we already afterwards asked for the whole presentation. We've already submitted it to the Hamcom folks to yep. publish, but it's also available on my website, and that link will be available to you at the end of my presentation. And that download contains mine and his. Okay, good. So it'll be in multiple places. Another thing I know the company is like, is Hammond still around that makes some other boxes and Mm-hmm. Are they still around? I haven't moved up recently. Yeah, I'm. Bowser's still still around. Well, you know, I didn't have time to cover this today, but I'm going to make time to cover it a little bit. As you grow in your home brewing, I highly recommend that you start building your own boxes. Um, yeah, because you can make a very, very simple metal break that'll take care of the metal bending. Spray paint baked on in a toaster oven. You'd be amazed at what you can do. And some of you guys, I mean, you know where the scrap metal is. Some of you guys are out there chasing the scrap metal generators, man. You know, storm spotting. You know that duct work that uh, laying all over those sites? It's, it's perfect metal for it. Any other questions? Hey, well, I appreciate everybody being patient while we got this going. Uh, you know, I hadn't used that computer in like a, a year. <laughs> I was like, I'm going to bring a thumb drive. Eric's like, oh, go ahead and bring yours in case something happens. <laughs> Something happened. <laughs> uh, go, ahead, go ahead and hit the uh, next slide. That's my email address, kd5kxf at gmail. If you guys have any questions or question on sources, um, I seem to be a storehouse of useless knowledge on where to buy what, uh, according to my wife anyway. So, I live in Balt Springs, Texas. Not far away from where the uh, armored van was parked yeah. at the Whataburger over there in Hutchins today. Uh, yeah, that's a little too close for home for me, you know. I don't know. I thought they shot him, but I, I haven't heard. I was no, I had had things to do. I had taken appliance to the appliance repair place and. Then my daughter says, oh, I want to go. You're going to Hemcom? So back home, go get her, you know. You're <laughs> fortunate to have a daughter to say something like that. No. Well, she likes to go to the Storm Spotters school. Oh, I don't know how many daughters that would say, I want to go to Hemcom, Daddy. 
Hey, she's cool to spot with too. She is cool to spot with. Uh, and her voice doesn't go up like her mother's does. <laughs> Mom, not so cool. Uh, anyway, I'm gonna let Eric get set up. I appreciate it. Thank you. Eric, if you want.